Welcome back to this episode of Alumni Bearcat Chats and a pleasure to be joined by the Vice President of Sports Programming at Sirius XM, Eric Spitz, and a proud Binghamton graduate from 1987. Hi, Eric. Jacob, how are you? Good to be with you. Thanks for coming on. Uh, let's talk first. We'll get to the Binghamton lineage in a moment, but uh, your day-to-day -day at Sirius XM, uh, certainly a vast company. How do you measure success? Obviously, there's not the typical uh, ratings or arbitrage mm -hmm. ratings. Uh, is it by number of subscribers? Is it by, how do you look at it? Yeah, I mean, the metrics are a little different. Um, some of the newer radios that we're installing in cars will provide more accurate data than we currently have. But the idea is just continue to grow the subscription base. Currently, we have 30, approximately 36 million subscribers, which is more than we had the year before, and hopefully not as many as we're going to have next year. So we've been able to continue to grow, um, really being able to, to, you know, to figure out or more people listening to one show or the other has been somewhat difficult. The streaming numbers do give you an indication of popularity. We also do a lot of surveys of our listeners of what they like and what they don't like and kind of make some decisions based on that. But the metrics are a little bit different, a little bit difficult, and, and hopefully over the years, uh, it will be a little bit easier to have a, a clear indication of, of who on our service people are listening to. Yeah, I guess it gets tricky as well. I think of NFL free agency, for instance. You've got Adam Shine on Mad Dog Sports Radio, who's doing an interview with Dak Prescott's agent. You also have a channel, NFL Radio. Yeah. Uh, yep. I mean, look, I, I see where you're going with, with the question. Like for us, it, it doesn't matter what you listen to as long as you're listening to SiriusXM. And, and, and so much of it for us is about content awareness, letting the subscriber know how much we have. And, and if you listen to SiriusXM and you're listening to, uh, we'll use your example, if you're listening to Adam Shine on Mad Dog Sports Radio, he may read a liner that tells people that, hey, it's NFL free agency, go listen to NFL radio. We're not necessarily expecting the listener at that moment to leave Adam Shine show to go listen to NFL radio, but we're putting something in, in his or her mind to like, hey, that's right, Sirius XM has extensive coverage of NFL free agency. The bottom line is one of my coworkers said, the bottom line for Sirius XM is we want you to swipe the credit card at the end of every month and stay with the service. And, and a big part of that is making you aware of all the great things that we have on SiriusXM. And I imagine there's cross-pollination outside of sports as well. Certainly Absolutely. people sign up for Sirius because of Howard and then you throw in a sports liner during, during Howard or on that channel. And Absolutely okay. right. Yeah, I mean, it, that's, that's what we're all about. We'll, we will be on the sports side promoting a new music channel and on a music uh, channel, they will read a liner saying, it's the NFL playoffs, and right now you can listen to the game on NFL Radio Channel 88. So it goes both ways. It's a little counterintuitive for talent to be telling people to listen <laughs> to something else. But as I said, we're not necessarily telling you at that moment to leave and listen to something else. We just want you to know that all that we have. And yes, we use the music platform to promote sports, the talk platform to promote sports. Everyone promotes everybody else with the idea of, of again, at the end of the month, we want you to, to, to feel totally invested in what we're doing. And it's, it's, it's really a need for you to keep subscribing to the service. You're certainly one of the premier talent evaluators uh, in the business. <laughs> how I do don't you, know about that. How do you evaluate whether it's at any of those levels, a good host, a good analyst, a good play-by-play -play person? Yeah, I mean, as far as the, the, um, the host... Uh, an analyst and sort of show team. Uh, you know, I, I, I mentioned this all the time uh, and I've, you and I, I'm sure have had this discussion, you know, privately, I, I, I call it poke passion, opinion, knowledge, and entertainment. And if you can do those four things, well, you're going to be an, an, an excellent sports talk show host. Uh, and, and, you know, there are a lot of folks out there that, are really passionate about sports, offer strong opinions, are really knowledgeable, but can they entertain on the radio for two hours or three hours or four hours? You know, that's the trick. You know, if you and I, you know, went out for a beer tonight uh, somewhere, uh, well, I assume probably most of the places I went out for a beer when I was in college likely aren't there anymore, but if they were, or we found a new place to go out, 
uh, it was a you know Thursday night, let's say, and there's you know a lot of NBA action going on. Um, we would find lots of passionate, opinionated, knowledgeable sports fans. But can they entertain on the radio? That's another story. So I, I always look at those four characteristics, and and I think if you look at those that do well on radio, whether that's Chris Mad Dog Russo on Sirius XM, whether that's Colin Coward or Dan Patrick or Pat McAfee, who also on Sirius XM, you know, whoever you think does really well, they, they likely score very high on that poke scale. Play-by-play, uh, play, it, it, it's a totally different animal. I, I do think um, you, you, you know, you have to have some of those elements for sure. You have to certainly have passion and you want to have an entertaining style. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think you're really should be offering really strong opinions, certainly not the play-by-play -play person. You do want to be knowledgeable, of course. So a lot of the same elements of the poke scale apply, uh, but it, it, you know, it's different. Um, and I do listen to a lot of play-by-play, -play, even though I'm not really working uh, in that world at this point. But, um, you know, there are certain dynamics that you look for in a play-by-play -play person, you know, in, in terms of their, you know, how often are they giving the score, you know, down in distance for football, um, you know, court geography, uh, is very important, you know, left side, right side, near side, far side, um, you know, that kind of stuff, delivering the play by play in a pace that's easy to understand, you know, some play by play people kind of go really fast. And while they may be keeping up with the play by play, as a listener, it can be somewhat distracting. Um, so, you know, there are certain elements that you listen for uh, with play by play, you know, it's different in all sports, you know, you're a guy that that's, you know, doing baseball, there's a lot more storytelling opportunities in baseball than you would clearly have in any of the other sports. So, you know, it's not so much how you call, you know, the grand slam that wins a game in the bottom of the ninth. It's how you call that, you know, ground ball is short in the third inning and how you call, you know, the, the fly ball to, to right in the fifth. You know, how you do then is more important to me than, than where you are on the big call because for every grand slam, Game winning homer, there's going to be 100 calls, 200, 500 calls that aren't as significant, but equally are important. What happens when the game is 10 2 after three innings? Then, yep, no, that's it. You know, that that's <laughs> that's that's the storytelling. That's yep. you know, how, how are you going to keep me you know, again? We'll go back to being entertained. How are you going to keep me entertained? How are you going to keep me listening when the game is out of hand? It's you know, it's it's late, you know, it's late September. My team's no longer in a pennant race. I'm still a fan of that team, I still want to listen. I want that play-by-play -play person to, to entertain. Tell me, uh, coming uh, to Binghamton, what led you there? And then uh, as a poly, well, let me start with what led you there. Okay. Well, yeah, look, I, I think for me back then, Binghamton was, you know, I applied to five or six schools and Binghamton was the best school academically. Um, and, and it was priced right as well. So it was a, it was a good combination uh, even though I had an idea at the time that I wanted to pursue some type of career in broadcasting, I really didn't have, I, I, it did not factor to my decision. I didn't, I didn't go look at colleges specifically that were, you know, that had great journalism programs, communications programs. Uh, for me, as I said, Binghamton was the, was the top academic school that I applied to. Uh, it wasn't, you know, too close to home, but it wasn't too far. Uh, and, um, and economically, it, it, it made sense as well. And then you study, uh, and where did you grow up, by the way? I grew up in Rockland County in, okay. uh, in Spring Valley, uh, a little, little north of the city. Right. So it wasn't so far from, from home. Uh, but then you uh, majored in poli sci, and uh, certainly broadcasting can be political, but I don't know if that was your intent. No, uh, <laughs> no. The poli, the, the poli sci major, my, my mom wanted me to be a lawyer. So I figured if I majored in poli sci and just decided to do what I would want to do sort of on the side, then she would be okay with it. So I majored in poli sci with no intention of pursuing a career in law, um, but there were no majors in communication, in journalism, and, and I don't think there are now. Um, so that was not, you know, part of the program there. So, you know, had as a guy that wants to work in radio, get experience in radio when there really were no, you know, there wasn't the major or coursework. And, and for me, it started out at, at, at working at the campus radio station, WHRW. Uh, I started working there first, probably the first week or two that I was on campus. So my friend and I did a, a weekly sports talk show. Uh, we did play by play 
of, of the basketball team, you know, the home games or most of the home games. Um, and, and it was just an incredible opportunity for us. And, and he didn't pursue a career in, in broadcasting. He was an accounting major and, and went in a completely different direction. But for me, at that time, I'm, you know, nobody grows up wanting to be like me. Everybody grows up wanting to be an on-air guy. So, like, for me, this was an incredible opportunity to go and do a bunch of play-by-play and kind of hone my skills there. And the thought at that point was I pursue a career on, on the air. Obviously, that, that changed over time. But WHRW presented an incredible opportunity for me to really get regular reps uh, as a first semester freshman. We did that sports talk show for four years. You know, every, every Friday night, I'm trying to think, I think it was like six to seven. I think it was on six to seven every Friday night for four years. And look, I'm sure there was nobody listening, but we, you know, we had a great time doing it and, and we got better at it as time went on. As far as the play-by-play went, I did play-by-play, he did color. And we, you know, it, it was, that was back when Binghamton was a division three program. Um, so, you know, you're playing against, you know, Plattsburgh and Potsdam in the old SUNYAC conference, as opposed to, you know, what, what you see now. Um, but for us, it, it didn't matter that it was Division Three. It didn't matter that it was, you know, Binghamton, Perhaps. Albany instead of North Carolina, Duke. It was right. it was college basketball games. We were doing you know, we were doing the, we were sitting courtside doing the game. There's nothing better. Well, that's the beauty of play by play. When people ask, I mean, a game is a game. So uh, I didn't know you did the play by play though. And then how do you end up uh, at Fan? Because folks, for to give context, WFAN was just a in its infancy at that point. Not even. I mean, right. FAN, uh, I, I graduated, as you mentioned, I, I graduated in 87. So I graduated in, in May of 87. The station signed on in July of 87. So, you know, we talk about getting into this business, which is very difficult, as you well know. And and so much of it is about luck and good timing and, and networking. So uh, through a, a connection that my dad had at, at what was then WNBC radio, uh, I was able to get an internship at WNBC after my freshman year of college. Uh, I also interned uh, with NBC uh, in the sports department, in the radio sports department after my uh, sophomore and junior years as well. So I was able to meet a lot of people uh, and, and really hone a lot of the skills I wasn't able to get at Binghamton because the courses weren't there. Uh, but more important than than the coursework or the skills were the connections. So a connection opened up the door for me to get into WNBC through my dad, and um, which is kind of a funny story. He was a, a, a contest. He used to call into the Imus in the Morning Show and, and win contests all the time. Sixty six egg McMuffins, sixty six Arby specialty sandwiches. Really, and and he would win, and he would he developed a friendship. Well, I don't want to say friendship, but a relationship with Imus's producer because it was Imus's producer who used to screen those calls and, and screen the contest line. So one day he won whatever he won, you know, egg McBuffins or whatever it was, and and he said to the producer, "Hey, you know, my son is a is a freshman at Binghamton and he's really interested in broadcasting. Like, do you guys have an internship program?" And he said to my father, "Like, tell your son here's the person to reach out to," and that opened that door for me, and, and then. When I graduated in, in 87, connections that I had made through my years at NBC helped get me an opportunity to interview for a job at, uh, at FAN. One of them actually was Howie Rose, who was doing some part-time work for NBC during the years that I was there. And Howie was working at the radio station at the time. He, among other folks, led me to, to reach out to the program director at the time, and I, I was able to get an entry-level job. So, you know, I, we talk about it all the time, you know, luck and good timing. If, if I graduate in 86 instead of 87, the staff is, you know, there's no radio station there. I'm probably getting a job someplace else. If I graduate in 88 instead of 87, then it's a completely different story. They're probably well-staffed and not looking for people. So it just worked out very well. I graduated. I had the connections, got my foot in the door at FAN, and then fortunately was able to move my way up there. Well, and you were just, it's a, you're at a unique point in radio history of, of this station that became so iconic, uh, just getting off the ground. Yeah, it was, it was, yes, I look, I, I had, you know, it was an entry level position. I remember the salary, it was, you know, $250 a week. I made $13,000 a year. Um, now, 
you know, it's not now, obviously it's a lot of years ago, but even then it was not a great salary, uh, but it was an opportunity to be at a radio station. And back then, you know, no one knew FAN may have survived six months, a year, two years, five, we didn't know. And certainly in those early days, it didn't look as if the station was going to make it through, you know, through a fifth anniversary. So we were just happy to be there and, and, and fortunate enough. And look, for me, I was at the very ground level. I was as entry level as entry level could be. I had nothing to do with any of the right decisions that were made or wrong decisions that were made, but I was fortunate to be there when the station then finally kind of caught on a couple of years in and became, you know, the, the success story that, that it became in, into the 90s. I know that you say people, they don't strive to be you. And I know what you're saying in terms of executive roles, mm -hmm. but when you become program director of FAN, was there a real sense of accomplishment? And even just walking into that office every day, uh, I mean, that's rarefied air. Yeah, I, I, I don't think you appreciate it in the moment because you're in it. Right. Um, so, you know, and, and so I probably didn't appreciate the opportunity to have that position as much as I would have looking back on it. Uh, but I, I, I certainly understood the magnitude of the radio station. Uh, and I actually left there uh, for a couple of years before coming back um, to take that position. Um, but it was, it, it was a special, you know, that radio station back then, uh, and, and for those of us that were there at the beginning and lived through those, you know, tenuous first months and years of the radio station to then see the station grow and have the success that it had uh, becoming the top billing station in the country uh, and the preeminent sports station in the country, it was extremely satisfying. Uh, I, 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 you know, and, and I, I think the folks that I work with now at Sirius XM, those that were there, uh, you know, I worked for a guy uh, named Steve Cohen. He and I worked together at FAN. Uh, Steve left FAN to help launch the sports department at Sirius XM. And for folks like Steve, who had been there from the beginning, basically, and, and you know, I remember someone just saying the other day about like the NFL draft. There was no NFL radio. They just kind of just did the NFL draft uh, on, on just on a channel, you know, it was not what it is now um, to see it from infancy to what it is now or the, uh, a robust department with, you know, 15 different sports channels and all that we do there. I'm sure there's a, a I know there's a great amount of satisfaction that guys like Steve and others that have been there for, you know, 10, 15 years or so feel. So the same thing they feel about Sirius XM is, is what I felt and others felt at FAN when FAN, you know, became successful. To hit on leadership for a moment, um, and especially people in business, I think would be interested in hearing, you deal with a lot of different personalities. You've had many personalities to, in, in radio that you've interacted with throughout your career. How do you manage that? It's tough. It, you know, I think the most difficult thing is that is to kind of put your ego aside because in, in, in our business, uh, in, in radio management, you know, if you're going to butt heads with, with a successful talent, ultimately you're not going to win that fight. So the most difficult thing I think is, and some of these, some of these guys are very easy to deal with and some not so much. So I, I, I think it's, it's, you know, kind of picking your spots and, and trying to get your, message across to them when you need to, um, you know, in, in a respectful way. And, and I think that's the most important consideration is just respect back and forth. And there's respect back and forth. And then, then even when you go through rough times with people, you'll, you'll get through it. It's, it's the times where there's that lack of respect that makes it uh, difficult. And I think like any, you know, any manager of a, you know, of a, a baseball team or a football coach is just, is, you can't manage everybody the same way. Uh, people, you know, some people respond to, to, to you being very assertive and others, that's the last thing that they want to hear. So I think there's a lot of psychology involved with trying to figure out, you know, how best to deal with, you know, with high level talent so that, you know, they feel as if, you know, you respect them, they respect you when you need them to, to do something that they'll, they'll do it because they may not agree, but there's that respect factor and trust pack factor back and forth. It's not easy. That's probably the most difficult thing to do uh, because there are times where, you know, you kind of want to just bite your tongue or have to bite your tongue to not, not say something. But uh, in the end, ultimately, 
it, it's 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 critically important to be able to manage high level talent if you want to be successful uh, as a manager in, in radio for sure and in any media I would say. And to bring it full circle, you were on campus a few weeks ago. I was. I was. Yes, my, my daughter Olivia is a high school senior, and, and she's uh, will be making her decision uh, at some point over the next uh, few weeks or month or two. And um, she, I was very proud that she got into Binghamton. I, I know how difficult it is to get into Binghamton now. It was hard to get into Binghamton when I got in. I remember um, walking, uh, going to. Uh, a weekend there in, I guess, June, um, like, I guess it was orientation weekend. Yeah, it must have been orientation weekend. I, I think it was in June. And I was walking around the campus with, with other fellow uh, incoming freshmen, and, and everyone was kind of just telling everyone else what they got on the SATs. Hmm. And you were hearing, like, you know, 1,400, 1,460, 1,500. And I remember thinking to myself, I must have written one hell of an essay because my <laughs> grades were the scores were not nearly what those scores yeah. were and that was then now it's even more competitive and more difficult to get in so I was really proud of her uh that, that she got into Binghamton I'm not sure that where she's going to wind up going but uh, nothing would make me happier than to have her spend the next four years uh, at the school because it was uh you know my, my it, it's hard to tell your kids that those are the four best years of your life like what about us <laughs> and of course, those moments are, are, are incredibly special and, and I love being a dad and all that comes with it. But if I look at, at, at four years of my life and, and say what were the best four years, uh, I, I would say the four years I spent in Binghamton were absolutely the best four years of my life. And your dorm room was still intact. It was. Uh, we, we did visit uh, Seneca. We couldn't get in. Um, but of, of all the things on campus, so much has changed, but I, I, I noted in, in sending a picture of, of, of myself standing in front of the dorm, the, the two things that haven't changed in the 30 plus years are Seneca looks the same and so do I. Um, but other than that, <laughs> everything is a lot different. The campus is beautiful. It's, it, it, was, it was fine back then when I was there, but it's so much, so much nicer. It's, you know, when I was there, there was actually a pub in the union. You know, when, when I was uh, there, the, the drinking age was now 21. It was it was 18 and then went up to 19. It was 19 and then it went up to 21. And when the drinking age went up to 21, it was not good for business for a campus pub. So ultimately the <laughs> campus pub, pub closed. But like looking at, and now the food court is in that area where the pub was. And we walked through there and I could not believe how beautiful it was. The union itself is, is a spectacular building. You know, we walked through the lecture halls, which we weren't able to get into any of the lecture halls because of uh, COVID, but just walking through that area and that actually looks pretty much the same as it was back then but just the event center and, and the, you know the baseball field and, and and so much has changed there the the dorms you know, college in the woods is basically the same although i guess there's a fifth dorm there that wasn't there when i was there i'm not sure the name of it but if you look at the other uh dorm areas residential life is so much different the the dorms are so much dickinson community is is much nicer the Newing much, much nicer than it was then. So I, I'm, I was so impressed and so proud of, of how great the school looked. Well, I'm sure uh, admissions will be, putting, will be putting the full court press on your daughter uh, after seeing this. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> wherever she ends up, great that she got to do that visit. And uh, really appreciate you being on our uh, alumni Bearcat Chats here. Yeah, Jacob, it's been, uh, it's been a fun 20 minutes or so. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for having me on.